Hello, I'm Mick Garris, and I'd like to welcome you to a special Z Channel screening for Academy Awards consideration. Our film tonight is a very original and striking one, and I must confess I'm quite enamored with it. It's Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane, formerly titled The Ninth Configuration. Our guest in the studio to talk about his film, a very personal film to him, is William Peter Blatty, who wrote, produced, and directed it. Bill, thanks for being here with us. My pleasure. It's a very unusual background to this film. Uh, it was originally a novel in the mid-60s, I believe. Yes, it was published under the title uh, Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane by Doubleday in 1966. I wrote it in about six weeks. They published the first draft, and after The Exorcist, uh, about a couple of, two, three years ago, I decided I'd squandered a wonderful idea, and I rewrote it. And uh, Harper and Row published it again under the title The Ninth Configuration. Now, I've never heard of a popular novel being rewritten completely from the same set of notes. Uh, so far as I know, it's probably the first time, at least in modern history, although I heard at the time that uh, uh, the Magus was being rewritten and prepared for republication. But I don't know if it was, uh, was reissued yet. Now, I assume that since the book was originally written in 1966, uh, it has had an interesting history coming to the screen. Well, if you call struggling and bleeding for 15 years trying to get it to the screen interesting, <laughs> I call it a little more than interesting. <laughs> uh, what is the story of the genesis of this? I have been trying for 15 years to get this motion picture made. And I have chased uh, phantom financing all across the world trying to get it made. and. Uh, a few years ago, about three years ago, I was in New York chasing shadows again, and I called my friend Mario Puzo. He was very dejected and said, let's go to dinner. And he said, why are you so down? I told him the story. He said, hey, Bill, Pepsi Cola's looking to finance movies. I sent them the screenplay. They got excited, and uh, we went into a co-venture, co-financing deal. Now, you're no slouch around Hollywood anyway. You've been writing screenplays for years. You wrote... Uh, Since 19... Uh, 60, I think, was my first. I've written about 12 motion pictures. Well, primarily you were known for your uh, comedy writing. I was uh, strictly known for comedy. That's all I ever wrote up until The Exorcist. Of course, some people say that I didn't break the strand of that <laughs> either. But, <laughs> but you had written uh, Shot in the Dark, Shot John the Goldfarb, Dark, Please, Please Come, Come Home, Home, Man uh, from the Diners what Club. What You Do in the War, Daddy, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Now, it must have been quite a shock to uh, the people who had followed your career when you came out with a novel as serious as The Exorcist. I have the impression that nobody noticed. Uh, up until the time I wrote The Exorcist, I was going through a dry period, and uh, comedy had dried up, and I couldn't get work writing a serious drama. I said, since I have nothing else to do but stand in the unemployment line, I think I'll write this book I've been planning for so many years now and show people I can write something other than comedy. Well, after it came out, I know of a couple of instances in, pr in which producers that I once done comedies for, without my knowledge, went to studios and pitched a comedy idea and said, hey, Bill Blatty would be perfect for this. And they'd say, Blatty, comedy? <laughs> well, the, the mythology is true in Hollywood. Well, having produced and written the film The Exorcist, I would not have thought that it would have been any problem to make whatever film you wanted to follow that up with. No, this one was a problem. Uh, no studio believed it was commercial. And furthermore, when a project has been passed on, just once is enough. But uh, right. I would retitle this and resubmit it for perhaps the fourth time <laughs> to the same <laughs> studio. <laughs> and they would always say, well, this must be the old laddie. We must have had a good reason for turning this down. So they well, it's all a thought it was non-commercial. It's a very unusual situation because it was sold as a fairly non-commercial film when it first was released as yes, the ninth that's configuration. Correct. That's correct. Fairly lofty artistic campaign. And it is lofty and artistic, but it's also an extremely entertaining and funny exciting film and to me uh, a very commercial one yes it is an entertainment and uh, i've been in a lot of sat with a lot of audiences all across the country uh, of every conceivable makeup and getting them into the theater is a problem but i promise you those who are in the theater find it a tremendous entertainment uh, i don't want to dwell on the message and the serious elements but it is an entertainment, and it is uplifting. Well, it does the have work. a point of view, too. 
and very sure. few films right now have that point of view. Oh, sure. uh, and it reflects your personal philosophy, I yeah. assume. Well, when you labor to get something made for 15 years, it's not just for the jokes. <laughs> right. Well, the first, at least, hour of the film is hilarious. It is nonstop, very strong comedy, but it becomes a very intense film and at times while not as graphic is as intense as say taxi driver yes it is well the comedy was deliberate uh it was to set you up and prepare you for the shock that is to come what do you feel about manipulating an audience in a film i think that's the i've been accused of i've sat with preview audiences heard a couple of kids uh one say to the other at the end of the film, well, there he goes, blatting, manipulating us again, just like he did in The Exorcist. And I thought, what's the matter with that? <laughs> Isn't that the purpose uh, of making a movie? Well, it, it uh, certainly is. Uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe was a manipulator, for heaven's sake. I mean, if, if you're saying that I have manipulated you into being surprised and or shocked and or being deeply moved by something, that I have tricked you, how does it, what does it matter how I got you there? I got you there. Isn't that the point of all great art anyway, is to manipulate its audience? Well, I wouldn't make so sweeping a statement as that. I am not too learned in these matters, but <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is my preference of work. Now, you've been quoted as saying that uh, the Cain story is um, the most important that you've been involved with to you. Why is that? Why is well, it so It's always personal? in my favorite. The characters of Cain and Cutshaw haunted me. Uh, ever since I wrote that novel. They have never left me. They've always been with me. And uh, when characters live with you for, for so long, that's what tells you that the work is important, at least to you. How much of it's Bill Blatty do we see in those characters? Well, a former wife once said that Cain and Cutshaw are the uh, opposing poles of your own person. That may or may not be true. I'm not going to be crazy enough to comment or confirm that. Do you see a little bit of Jekyll and Hyde in yourself? Uh, there's a little Jekyll and Hyde in everybody. Take that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and do with it what I want. Now, it was very unusual circumstances under which uh, the film was made. It was not made in this country. Uh, why did you choose Hungary as the primary location? It was cheap. <laughs> uh, Pepsi Cola offered me a list of seven countries in which they had block funds. One of them was Hungary, and I selected Hungary since they had the longest tradition of motion picture making. <laughs> the uh, ca however, we didn't suffer for it. We came in four days under schedule, shooting in Budapest. Uh, I defy anyone to be able to tell that that castle interior is not a practical location as opposed to a set, which it is. What were some of the problems uh, in the production of the film? Well, being a first-time director and working through six interpreters <laughs> is a little bit of a problem. I there was my so. own terror at the prospect of uh, directing for the first time. I'd never directed my grandmother across the street before. <laughs> and thank God I had a wonderful cinematographer and Jerry Fisher who did most of Joe Losey's films. I couldn't have done it without him. Now, you wrote, produced, and directed this film. That's, uh, I would call that an auteur film. Yes, and uh, co-financed it, which makes it a uh, semi-dementia uh, film. <laughs> <laughs> and you also and violated the first principle of nature. Never you invested never put your money own. into your own film. And you also have a fairly sizable role in the film. How did that come about? Oh, it's a small part. Well, uh, it's a meaty one. Originally, uh, Scott Wilson was signed to play the role of Captain Edward Frome, which is a small part, but a, a, a juicy part. Uh, during rehearsal, I realized that I had miscast my two leads. They were wonderful actors, but I'd miscast them. And we had three days go to go until we started shooting, and I read Scott Wilson, who most people remember from In Cold Blood, and he was wonderful, and I made him one of the two leads. Got Stacy Keach over in 48 hours, and uh, there was nobody else around. We couldn't, I couldn't go casting at that point, so I just filled in the role of Captain Prom. I and enjoyed it. And a lot of hand made took a, and you took forever to get that uh, first shot between uh, Captain Frome and Stacy because every time Stacy turned around and looked at me, either he or I would go up. <laughs> <laughs> Had you acted before this? Oh, in college, not really. No. Did you uh, pursue theater arts when you were in college? No. Uh, we had no such courses at Georgetown University in theater arts, not even in uh, creative writing. Uh, you acted, of course, we had a drama club, and there were heavy presentations, but uh, 
even then I never directed. As a writer, do you find it to be a, a struggle to sit behind the typewriter and actually pound it out? It is the hardest work that I know. Uh, it didn't used to be quite as hard. I know when I wrote comedy, usually in the wee hours of the morning, I would get an immediate gratification if something really terribly funny occurred to me. You know, it, it, it's as though someone else had just said something funny, and I would actually laugh about it <laughs> all by myself. But uh, during man. and since The Exorcist, it's a lot more like mental manual labor. I mean, I love having done it, but mm -hmm. uh, I but the must process. be dragged to the typewriter. Now, The Exorcist, did you expect the uh, phenomenon you created? I expected the novel to be a smash. I knew that when I was halfway through the writing of it. Uh, when I saw the rough cut of uh, the film, I expected it to be a powerful and w very well-received film, a hit. But I had no idea it was going to be the phenomenon that it turned out to be. Was it a very know. heavily researched novel? Oh, my Lord, I started researching that when I was in college. I'm not going to tell you when that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems that The Exorcist and the, the novel Killer Kane were both quite an about-face for you, having done fairly frivolous comedy films. These are both really meaningful to you. Well, they are, and there comes a point in your life or in some people's lives, when you reflect, I'm getting very, very well paid to do something that I like, which is make people laugh. But what is that really doing for them? And therefore, what is it that I am doing with my life? Now, after eight years of Jesuit education, I decided that in the vehicle of the exorcist and in Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane, there was a vehicle for repaying what I had learned and for passing on some of what I had learned, those elements that are most hopeful and optimistic, and I feel a little bit more useful. For all of the terror and intensity of The Exorcist and Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane, they're very uplifting films in many ways. And they are, although the ending of The Exorcist was widely misunderstood and not accepted as an uplifting film, I must say, which was why I was so careful about the epilogue to Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. Would you like to clarify the ending of The Exorcist for those who may not have got your point? For those who think that the demon triumphed and carried <laughs> Karis out the window, that is, that is not correct. That is not, it would take too long to explain it. All right, let's talk a little bit now. You were not particularly enamored of the heretic. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> so uh, you have come up with your own sequel called the Legion. I'm glad you said my own because uh, rarely does a week go by someone does not ask me, did you write The Heretic? And I want to mm. hit them in the mouth. Oh. Um, not that I'm that wonderful a writer, but really, that has to be the worst motion picture I've ever seen in my life. Um, but Legion is going to be my idea of what the sequel to The Exorcist should have been. Had you uh, intentionally avoided being involved with a sequel to The Exorcist? Yes, I was asked to write the screenplay. I didn't want to. I didn't. I thought that the story ended there. That, that's it. But there has since occurred to me a story just so marvelous. The, I don't think The Exorcist was frightening. I, 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 I realize it's had that impact, but I never meant it to be that frightening. I meant it to be intriguing and fascinating, a supernatural detective story. It certainly but was more this, than that. Uh, Legion is uh, my idea. Do you want to give us an idea of what it's about, or should we wait? Well, I will only tell you that nothing levitates, that it's the cerebral supernatural that is involved. And the title comes from a passage in the scripture where Christ meets a man who was possessed, and he asks him, what is your name? And the man answers, Legion, for we are many. Well, it sounds very interesting. And now we're going to take a look for consider uh, Academy Award consideration, Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. Bill Blatty, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you very much, Nick. It was a pleasure.